Welcome to the Why on Earth Community Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron William Perry, and today we're visiting for a second time with Hunter Lovins. Hunter, it's so great to be with you. Oh, Aaron, it's a thrill. And I'm really excited that uh, in this episode, we're going to take a deep dive into COP. Uh, the United, Not policemen. Yeah, the United Nations. Um, Conference of Parties, the annual exercise in frustration where the world comes together to talk climate. Yeah. So um, before we get going, I'll just share a little about your background, Hunter. L. Hunter Lovins, Time Magazine's Millennium Hero for the Planet, is a business professor, president, and founder of Natural Capitalism Solutions, and co-author of The Way Out, A Finer Future, and the best-selling Natural Capitalism. Hunter consults corporations, governments, and non-governmental organizations, and has taught at many universities. She is also a managing partner of Now Partners, uh, and has addressed major gatherings, such as the World Economic Forum, the United States Congress, and the World Summit on Sustainable Development, uh, and has participated in leadership roles in many of the United Nations Conference of the Parties, the COP. So, uh, COP, here we are recording this just actually a few days before you depart Colorado on your way to Europe and then to Dubai for COP28. Um, COP28, why, why 28? What, what, what is this? Why the number 28? 30 years ago, the UN and many of the world's nations came together to frame the Framework Convention on Climate Change, where the world's nations agreed to keep global warming below a dangerous level. Huh. We have failed, and the warming is going ever up. Ever since then, the parties, the nations that signed this Framework Convention have gotten together more or less every year, the first year or so they had a gap or two, to try to figure out how to achieve this, how to stop global warming, and failed. In the 28 years in which there have been COPs, or the 30 years since the framework, emissions have doubled. This will be the hottest year ever on record in human history, and it may well push us above the 1.5 degree Celsius additional warming above what the planet was when humans evolved on it. We are, for the scientists amongst you, we are at somewhere around 424 parts per million concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. When humans evolved, it was at 280 parts per million. Scientists agree that the so-called safe number is 350. Anything above that is dangerous, so we're already in the red zone. And indeed, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, has said this is code red for humanity. And you, you've seen it this summer, the deaths in Maui of the United States of the better part of 100 people from a wildfire driven by hurricane force winds because there was a very unusual hurricane north of the Hawaiian Islands. The floods in the last week or so across Europe, I was just corresponding with a friend in Switzerland who said that his garden is now under four feet of water. The devastation in Libya because of a medicane, this is a Mediterranean hurricane, a, a new term for us, the famine a third of a billion people are now at risk of starvation. Not, not just that they're hungry. The, the World Food Program says it is now taking food from hungry people to feed to starving people. Because of the droughts across the Horn of Africa and in other parts of the world. And it's just getting worse. And I can go on and on and on. <laughs> don't do this. Don't go doom scrolling on the bad news on climate because it, you get to the point where you just go, we're not going to make it. And indeed, I've stood with some of our most eminent scientists with tears rolling down their face as they say, we're not going to make it. The reason that I'm going to burn jet fuel to go to Dubai, which will be the Disneyland of all cops, <laughs> 
headed by the man who runs the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. <laughs> you really think we're going to get a climate solution out of this one? Is because we know how to solve this crisis, and we know how to solve the crisis at a profit. If we do two things, stop emissions because we switch to renewable energy, which is now everywhere on Earth cheaper than burning fossil energy. And if we take the excess carbon out of the air and put it back in the soil where it belongs, where it becomes a nutrient, carbon is the basis of all of life. How did it come to be the world's largest pollutant? Well, like all pollution, it is a resource out of place. We've put too much of it into the atmosphere, too much of it into the oceans, so the oceans are acidifying. Now we need to put it back where it belongs, which is in the soil. How do you do that? You do regenerative agriculture. This is the kind of agriculture that increasing numbers of farmers and ranchers are turning to because it's more profitable. And when you do this, you get higher nutrient density food, you get healthier farm communities, healthier farm families, you're healthier, and we're well on our way to solving the climate crisis. An illustrative number, this is a back of the envelope calculation. If we did, for example, regenerative grazing, this is grazing like <coughs> emerged, well, the bison in, across the North American Great Plains, the greatest land managers ever, were dense packed because of predators, wolves. If you're about to get eaten, the safe place to be is in the middle of the herd. Everybody's trying to get there. They're eating everything in front of them, trampling everything under them, fertilizing everything behind them. They keep moving. They don't come back till the grass has regrown. This is what put the 10 feet of thick black soil into the Great Plains prairies. We know how to do this again. Paper by a scientist named Greg Ritalik showed that 60 million years ago, the Earth was at a thousand parts per million concentration of CO2. When humans evolved, 280, where'd the carbon go? Hmm. He showed it went into the soil because of grazing animals. At around 30 million years ago or so, there evolved little grazing animals, pre-horses, that nibbled the grasses at the edge of the forest. Oh, uh, at a thousand parts per million, <clears throat> the earth is carpeted in forest, which is to say planting trees is not the answer. Grass is the answer. Grass has 40 times the carbon per weight of a tree, and almost all of its biomass is below ground. When an animal nibbles grass, the roots slough polysaccharide sugars. This feeds the microbiological community in the soil, particularly the mycorrhizal fungi, that is what mineralizes the carbon. Here on my ranch, I test the soil every year. I'm part of a citizen science initiative where 50 out of us do this every year. And every year I'm a nominee for the Humongous Fungus Award. This is the <laughs> highest concentration of mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. I've said, stop giving it to me. Uh, I won the award the first time it was given. I said, stop giving it to me. Spread it around to other farmers and ranchers who are also doing a good job. I get it because we grazed the ground here. When I bought this place, it was bare soil. It now has a healthy crop of grass. That grass is sequestering carbon. <clears throat> Add to that the solar panels out front, which is what's powering our ability to have this conversation the electric car in the garage, the batteries in the garage that power the electric car, the heat pump out back, the energy efficiency that I've done in the building. All of these, if all of us did this, we solve the climate crisis. So illustrative number, do this sort of thing. Grazing on all the world's grasslands, 60 to 100 years we get back to 280 to 300 parts per million. The pre-industrial level of carbon concentration in the atmosphere. We've rolled climate change backward at a profit. That's incredible. And that's why it's worth going to COP, to talk about these things. I'm part of a group, Future Economy Forum, 
that will be putting on dialogues in the Blue Zone, five dialogues a day and then an evening film festival, as well as high-level suppers at houses of various sheikhs and in the Terra Pavilion with CEOs, heads of state, ministers, youth delegates, indigenous representatives, activists, talking about these solutions, and particularly about regenerative agriculture. Pretty much everybody knows renewable energy is a good thing. Recent news out of China. China is moving so fast that this may be the year of peak Chinese emissions. Wow. That news was just out yesterday, or actually last week, article in The Guardian that uh, car China's carbon emissions could peak this year before falling into a structural decline for the first time because of a record surge in clean energy investments. Why is China doing this? They can't breathe. Their cities are so dirty from burning coal from all of the traffic. So China is already well ahead of its target for this year of 20% of its vehicles being electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. And Europe is now starting to do the same thing. Recent report out from Europe that um, Europe's electricity transition has hit hyperdrive. EU is on track for a huge collapse in fossil power. Again, why? It's cheaper. This is just better business. Now, COP. What the hell is COP? Yeah. Conference of Parties. This is in itself part of why we've had 28 of these things and haven't solved the climate crisis. The parties are the nations. Of the signatories to the Framework Convention, at least 16, probably more like 25, are economically dependent on fossil industries. Saudi makes a billion dollars a day every day they delay action on climate change. Yeah. You really think they're going to come to COP and say, oh, okay, end of fossil. Now, the Europeans are calling for this. California signed the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, as have now I think it's about 12 nations. We've been calling for this at every COP for years. We've been calling for a transition plan, particularly around climate justice. It is simply unjust that the developed nations, which are responsible for essentially 96% of all emissions in all time, are economically better prepared to adapt. You know, as Lahaina showed, none of us are entirely prepared to adapt. But the countries like Pakistan, which have emitted something like 4% of all emissions over all time, are bearing the worst of it. Mm -hmm. The floods in Pakistan a year or so ago killed thousands of people, displaced millions of people. They're still rebuilding from that. There are whole island nations that are going to move. Mm -hmm. Just pick up, and because their island is going underwater. And again, the famine in Africa, the, uh, all of the climate devastation is hitting the developing world vastly harder than it's hitting us, and they didn't cause this problem. So figuring out a transition that allows them to get the benefits of renewable energy, of regenerative agriculture, that helps them pay for that. And this is one of the fights we're going to have at COP. Loss and damage. At the Paris COP, the Paris Climate Summit, which was the last time the world actually really got something achieved. The brilliant diplomacy of Christiana Figueres, Lawrence Tubiana, who led that COP, got the world to agree that, okay, as a world we can't set targets, but every nation will set INDCs individual national determined contribution. So what is your nation going to contribute to solving the climate crisis? Well, this year is the stock taking 
from Paris. And the stock taking is already showing. We're way behind schedule. Some nations, you know, like China, legitimately can uh, celebrate what they're doing. The U.S. Is, is way behind. And all of the Western nations are, are way behind. Again, despite the helpful statistics that I cited. And the, it's getting to the point it's almost too late. Because one of, another thing that will come out, well, is coming out now, recent report out from uh, the scientist uh, William Ripple, the amplifications of climate change. So it's not just how much carbon is in the atmosphere or how warm the planet's getting on, on total. It's when the polar caps start to melt, you have more dark ocean, absorbs more heat, warms the planet faster. When you start warming parts of the ocean, the circulation stops flowing. So the, what's called AMOC, uh, Atlantic Meridial Overturning Circulation, which is what brings the warm water from the Gulf of Mexico across the Atlantic, up past North Europe, and up towards Greenland. Nature as usual, that Cold water, cold salty water sinks. You melt the ice in Greenland, it's no longer salty, it stops sinking and the circulation stops. And this is already happening. The El Nino that this year is going to be extreme. You put all of these what are called tipping points together. The great scientist, Dr. Johan Rockström, has several papers out recently on the tipping points. This can trip the, the planet as a whole into a whole new state of discontinuity where it goes faster and faster and faster. When you melt the boreal, well, melt, melt the Arctic ice, the boreal forest starts to warm up and starts to release methane. Methane is... 28 to 100 times more potent a warmer of the earth than even CO2. There's just a lot less of it. So we tend to talk about CO2. These are scary. Yeah. And this is where, you know, you just go, we're not going to make it. So a couple weeks ago, people have been, with all these reports coming out, people have been writing to me, what do we do? So I wrote a piece in Climate and capital media on how I deal with climate despair. Walking through, first off, the good news. Well, first off, saying, it's not your fault. You didn't cause this problem. Something like 70% of all emissions over all time have come from 100 entities. The big fossil companies, the big carbon companies, some of the steel companies, the oil majors, the oil emitting countries, you're not the problem. Yes, there's, you can do things as I have to make your home more comfortable, to cut your electricity bill, cut your fuel bill, and help be part of the solution. But the real challenge is getting the, the big emitters to stop this. Second, look at what's happening. We are in a transition that will wholly change how we power ourselves, how we run our society for the better. Third, get active. Every day, ask yourself, what's my dot? Do one thing. Every day, do something to be active, to get engaged. I'm part of a group that is putting together a global climate movement. It's, it's still a little bit in stealth. We're, uh, we're still putting the pieces together, getting, getting the funding pulled together. But watch this space. Pretty quick, we are going to launch building a global home for everyone on the planet who wants to be part of the solution. People say, but what can I do? I'm just one person said 8 billion people. <laughs>
I love this. Hunter, it's um, amazing getting all of this information and I want to circle back to the despair piece in a, in a moment, but first I want to ask, when you're speaking about the blue zone, for example, <laughs> at COP, can you just paint, paint for us the picture of what, what are the zones, what's going on, how many people, like what, what, what is it like being at these gatherings? Utter madness, <laughs> utter <laughs> chaos. Literally, last year at the COP in Egypt, the sewer system exploded into the UN's meeting rooms, and there was a river of shit flowing out of the Blue Zone. The Blue Zone is the UN's zone. Remember, COP is conference of parties. So to the UN's point of view, the only thing that matters are the nations who come together to negotiate. This is the, the official proceedings. This is why COPs happen. Yeah. However, the rest of the world, as COPs happen year on year on year, said, you guys aren't getting it done. Um, can, can we be part of this? The UN said, no, go away, you're not a party. In fairness to the UN, they said, whoa, whoa. Nonprofit organizations, what they call NGOs, non-governmental organizations, should have a voice. So how about we allow observers and so I am officially a delegate to the COP, a UN from a UN accredited observer organization. Natural Capitalism Solutions is an accredited observer organization. Year on year on year, the UN has done more and more and more to try to welcome the observers to give them a role in the blue zone. Now at the same time in Copenhagen, which was 2009, the Copenhagen COP, they said, let's give the NGOs their own space. They can all come together and talk to each other. And so they called that the green zone. The green zone is typically a y'all come. The blue zone, you have to be nominated by an observer organization and they issue a certain number of passes per organization and every year they neck it down. Last year, almost 50,000 people came to Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. This year, the projections are 70,000 are coming to the exhibition center in Dubai. They, have, they are literally, as we speak, building more buildings to house all of this. Almost all of those are observers. There's something like 600 national delegates, mm, about 50, 60 of whom are the real players. And they meet sometimes behind closed doors, but often in open sessions and the observers can be there. And there is a whole protocol for how observer organizations can put forward information, can engage. So there will be all of that going on. Meantime, in starting it about in Paris, there were created what are called pavilions in the blue zone, which are spaces where various organizations, corporations, countries can showcase what they're doing, have a space to hold events called side events. And so you can go on the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC website for COP28 and download the program for the Blue Zone. You can also go to the UAE, United Arab Emirates, website for COP28 and download the program for the Green Zone. Now, with so many people coming, they are requiring registration for the Green Zone, but it is still aimed to be a everybody come. There are, at any given point in time, dozens to hundreds of side events happening. You cannot go to them all. We are promised that this year the organization will be better. The, the Emirates are very clear. They want COP28 to be a success. They want people to talk about Dubai the way we talk about the Paris COP, the Paris Accord, the Paris success. They want that for this COP. And blessings on them if they can pull this off. The world desperately needs for this to succeed. Note to self, it won't. There will be grand <laughs> pronouncements. 
uh, expect a pronouncement on of the creation of a fund for loss and damage, where the rich countries put money in to pay for helping the poor countries adapt, deal with the damages. This agreement was already essentially reached. It will be in the World Bank, which the G77, the 77 uh, of the poorer countries said, we don't want it to be at the World Bank. Sorry, the U.S. said, hey, if we're putting money in, it's going to be the World Bank, headquartered in Washington. So there's going to be a fight over that, but there will be a pronouncement that, ta-da, there's a loss and damage fund of uh, several hundred million. Mm, that's it. The amount needed, the amount mm-hmm. promised when we first started talking about loss and damages was $100 billion. So we're a little short. Yeah. There, will, there may be a brilliant announcement by these countries that are putting together the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. That's actually a big deal. And here's hoping for that. To me, the real achievement uh, that happened at COPS come out of the side events. At last year's COP, Future Economy Forum teamed with this brilliant company in Egypt, Sekem. We hosted dialogues in the evening outside the Blue Zone. We got, had a couple villas and a beautiful garden and, again, hosted heads of state and ministers and representatives. Out of that came an agreement that Sekem who works with farmers helping them convert to regenerative agriculture would create carbon credits for the carbon that these farmers, initially 2,000 Egyptian farmers, some of the poorest farmers on earth, are taking out of the air and putting into the soil. At COP, we expanded that to about 40,000 farmers, got the deal done. It's issued as part of the Egyptian stock exchange got companies out of Europe to agree to buy these credits. What this is doing is funding climate heroes, farmers who are transitioning from industrial farming to regenerative farming, moving away from diesel generator sets, doing regenerative grazing, growing organically. And the because the credits help pay the farmers, They can price their organic produce at cheaper than the chemically produced produce, helping transform Egypt away from chemical agriculture to regenerative agriculture. That was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I'm truly honored to have had a tiny hand in in bringing that together. So this is the sort of thing that we're going to try to achieve at COP. If all these people are going to come together, let's get her done. Mm -hmm. Absolutely wonderful. Well, let me ask, I, I got to give a shout out to that our, our friends at Secum also, from what I understand, practice biodynamics, which is one of they the do. things we love to talk about um, in other episodes of the Why on Earth Community podcast uh, as, as one of many approaches to regenerative agriculture. And I'm so curious, Hunter, to ask you, when identifying the, the twofold requirements of decarbonizing, uh, defossilizing energy and recarbonizing soil, sequestering carbon in soil through regenerative practices. What do you see as the, the primary mechanisms for all of that to occur from an economic standpoint? Because when you're describing what happened at Sekum in Egypt, what I'm thinking to myself is, hey, this is, this is natural capitalism at work, right? The externalities and the uh, suite of benefits are starting to get more accurately reflected in the various pricing of the regenerative foods versus the conventional chemical foods, right? So what do you see as the primary drivers that will help scale uh, all of this in in those two categories of of decarbonizing, defossilizing energy and uh, sequestering carbon in the soil? Very important question. And policy has a real role in this. Market mechanisms are incredibly powerful, but we don't have a market. Mm -hmm. Free market. Let the free market do it. It's like a bad light bulb joke. How many economists does it take to screw in a light bulb? None. The free market will do it. (laughs) The invisible hand, huh? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, No, it won't. (laughs) Anybody who's ever climbed a ladder knows darn well you've got to change that bulb. The fossil industries receive 
something like $7.2 trillion every year in subsidies to make fossil energy look cheaper than it is. So even though the renewables are cheaper, they don't necessarily look that way because of these perverse subsidies. So getting rid of perverse subsidies would really help. And I keep hoping every year at the COP that the nations will at least agree to that. But again, they won't because any one nation can veto any action at a COP, hmm. which means the nations that are receiving all these subsidies uh, don't want to give up their gravy train. Hmm. And I believe in the tooth fairy too. <laughs> Change is hard. You go about your daily life you drive the car you've been driving, you heat your house in the way you've been heating it, you buy the cheapest food at the grocery store. What, now I have to pay attention to what food I'm buying? I mean, you should because when you buy organic biodynamic food, you're making yourself healthier. But yeah, you have to pay attention. And that's hard. Some people can't afford it. So payments to help, and this is what, this is Seccom's genius, of if they can pay the farmers because the farmers are delivering a service that the world needs by sequestering carbon, the farmers can cut their prices for their food and thus people will preferentially buy it because it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. So policy helps. In the United States, the so-called Inflation Redu Reduction Act may drive solar prices down to the point Credit Suisse, back when there was a Credit Suisse, said by 2025, solar will be at one cent per kilowatt hour. What's, what are you paying on your electric bill? I'm going to hazard a guess. It's at least 13 cents, if not 18. Some places pay 25. Build a new nuke, nuclear plant. It'll cost you at least 20 cents a kilowatt hour just to build the thing, let alone the cost of decommissioning it when it dies, which is about the same amount all over again. New coal plants are at around 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Solar right now is commercially offered at around 3 cents a kilowatt hour. Here in Colorado, the coal-loving utility, Excel Energy, put out a bid for new power. <laughs> they were overbid 100 times. They believed natural gas would win. Gas came in at 4 cents a kilowatt hour. Solar came in, let's see, a bit above three cents. Wind came in below three cents. Solar plus wind plus batteries, storage, came in at around three cent a kilowatt hour. Excel said no. <laughs> Solar tariffs, uh, bid it again. Everybody bid it again, 5,300 megawatts bid. They wanted 1,100 megawatts. Three cent a kilowatt hour, wind, solar, storage. So this is on commercial offer. And, and it's, it's true around the country. And prices continue to fall for renewables. The Inflation Reduction Act said, buy an electric car. We'll give you, what, $7,500 tax credit. Put in a heat pump. We'll give you tax credit. To utilities, install battery storage so that when you have all this solar and nobody wants it, and then when the sun doesn't shine at night, you want the power, put it into batteries. We're now building massive battery storage. Texas recently, you know, uh, Texans are, we're oil country. We don't like renewable energy. <laughs> Guess what is the biggest wind producer in the United States? Texas. Mm -hmm and one of the biggest solar producers because of economics. It's just plain cheaper. And the Texans said, yeah, well, but we had this terrible cold snap and all the wind turbines froze. Actually, they didn't all freeze, but neither had they winterized them. And the gas plants froze too, which is why the grid went down. Batteries, I have batteries here. If power goes out, we're in a rural area, power goes out. All the time, actually, and I only know it because the clock's blinking in the morning. I have batteries in the garage, and they just automatically take over. Right now, sun's shining, we're not using much power, I'm selling to the local utility. This is good for me. Every home ought to be this way. 
And we can design this. You can have vehicle to grid so that my electric car is just sort of sitting in there. It could be sending excess power from its battery to the grid. Hot summer afternoon, if I'm not driving, let it be, help feed the grid. This can be done. We, we have all the technology. We know how to do this. It's just a matter of digging our heads out and saying, you know what? Climate's a crisis. Let's solve it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's fabulous. Well, let me, let me ask this, Hunter, because I know it's something that uh, a lot of us are experiencing in our own uh, unique ways. This, this, this issue of feeling the, the despair, the sadness, the, for some of us, it's, it, there's a grieving uh, associated with all of this. What, uh, I got to ask this probably in a couple of parts. How the heck, knowing what you know, and, and having been involved in these processes as uh, deeply as you've been, what, what keeps you from giving up entirely, knowing that despite the, the, the trends and the economics increasingly playing in our favor, we're, we're still up against such tremendous inertia in, in the wrong direction. What, A, keeps you from giving up? And, and B, what, it, what is this... Uh, insight around uh, despair that uh, you shared in this article you recently wrote? I said there are five steps to empowerment. First is face reality, mm -hmm. because we do know what to do. Yes, we are in a crisis, and we know how to solve it, so let's go. Two, have courage. Be brave. We will lose much. We are losing lives now to climate change and to conflict and to COVID pandemics. We are, we're actually in what's now being called a poly crisis. There are all these crises coming on top of us. But the earth has amazing regenerative capacities. We need to learn to be like grass, to bend, not break. Care for you and your people, so that together we can care for all. Each of us has to find what it is in ourselves that needs replenishment. I was once on a panel at a big green conference out in California, and they were going down the panel as a closing exercise of, what do you do for well-being? And they got to me, and time had run out, and I said, beef and whiskey. <laughs> I mean, what? For me, that's actually true. I run on high quality protein. When I'm doing these <laughs> round the world jaunts, getting no sleep, high energy, I need high quality protein. At the end of the day, I need a drink with a friend mm -hmm. to just wind down. So the next year at the conference, they <laughs> opened it with uh, an evening of beef and whiskey. <laughs> it's not for everyone. It's what is for me. Find your voice. You have something to say that your family, your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers need to hear. One empowered person begins to change everyone around them. Each of us has something like 20 people who look at what it is we do and care. What you do with your life makes a difference. It inspires those around you. And, and this is the last one. Find your power. This is the dot. Do one thing. You aren't alone. As I said, very shortly we will be standing up this global brand of climate activism, of climate care, of climate engagement. And it's going to take all of us. So... Uh, Stay tuned and join us. Absolutely wonderful, Hunter. It is uh, such a joy to have this opportunity to visit with you. And I want to uh, remind our audience, this is the Why on Earth Community Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron William Perry. And uh, we are visiting with Hunter Lovins uh, just a few days before she departs to Europe and then Dubai for COP28. And I want to be sure to 
give a shout out and thank a few of our partners and sponsors who make our podcast series possible. This includes uh, Chelsea Green Publishing. Uh, with Chelsea Green, you can use the c code YOE35 for a 35% discount on any of their books and audiobooks. Also, if you go to whyonearth.org and you go to our partners and supporters page, you'll see Chelsea Green amid many other of our wonderful uh, collaborating sponsors and partners, many of whom are offering special deals to our audience. Uh, this also includes Purium Organic Superfoods. They're offering $50 off your first order or 25%, whichever's greater. Waylay Water Soaking Salts. These are the Colorado uh, grown biodynamically and regeneratively grown hemp infused aromatherapy soaking salts we make for the Why on Earth community. Uh, Profitable Purpose Consulting, Earth Hero Sustainable Products, Soil Works Biodynamic Garden Preparation, Earth Coast Productions, our dear friend Artem Nikolkov and his team, and of course our uh, growing global network of ambassadors. And uh, for our ambassadors, we have a number of additional benefits, including our monthly Zoom meetup and our uh, ambassador resources. These are recordings from conference proceedings and our behind the scenes segments that we record with many of our podcast guests after we conclude our main episodes uh, together. And if you're not yet activated as an ambassador and you'd like to be, you go to whyonearth.org. Uh, to get that set up. Many of our ambassadors are giving through our monthly giving program at varying levels. And if you give at the $33 or greater level as a thank you, we'll send you a jar of the Waylay Waters soaking salts each month for your self-care practices, connecting <laughs> some dots there. Now, um, you can connect with Hunter and her team uh, at Natural Capitalism Solutions by going to natcapsolutions.org. And also, you can get more information uh, at futureeconomy.forum regarding COP28 in particular. Uh, a number of uh, uh, informational pieces available there. And of course, these links are available in the uh, show notes to the uh, podcast episode. We'll also include the links that Hunter mentioned to the uh, United Nations FCCC uh, resources and the United Arab Emirates resources for COP28 in particular. And, you know, Hunter, before... Uh, oh, I should also mention, yeah. I'm going to be live blogging. Ah, wonderful. From COP. So yeah. you can you can ride along with me at a site called Climate and Capital Media. Wonderful. Which is Climate and Capital Media all run together dot com. All right. I'm jotting this down quickly and legibly. Um <laughs> So we'll make sure that link is in there as well. That's so great to hear, Hunter. And, and Hunter, before we conclude our main episode and, and do a little five, ten minute behind the scene segment for our uh, ambassadors, that exclusive content, um, you know, I just I want to, first of all, uh, acknowledge and thank you for all of huh. the work you've been doing all of these years. And, you know, I, I had the uh, opportunity to first meet you clear back, gosh, 20, 25 years ago, back when uh, I was working at Sustainable Settings, one of our favorite uh, biodynamic regenerative farms here in Colorado. And, and uh, knowing how much you and your work in particular have impacted thousands, millions perhaps, of uh, other organizational leaders, other activists, other folks who are leaning into doing what can be done and what must be done. And so first off, I just, I want to give a, a major acknowledgement, Hunter, for all of that. It's Aaron, tremendous. thank you. Absolutely. Secondly, I, you know, I want to open the floor up to you. Uh, you've, you've given us so much information here, including the five steps to empowerment, um, which is brilliant. Uh, I just, I want to open the floor up and just ask you, you know, for our audience, uh, what is it that you would that you would say in the, in the in the face of all of this sort of going beyond the five steps you've already articulated what is, what is your sense for what's possible in the next handful of years what's your sense for what we might all achieve together if if enough of us <laughs> that critical mass of us mobilizes leans in and says yeah we we are going to make this happen what does that look like you and I have spoken of this. I 
almost hung up my spurs a couple of years ago. And I, I asked myself, put together everything that I do, writing books, teaching, consulting, going down the road. Is it enough? No. <laughs> you look at the science, we're losing. Do I know what enough is? No. My husband had been after me to retire, and my partner, Walter Link, of Now Partners, asked if I would come on a trip to Munich, Rome, Assisi, help him do back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back workshops, big uh, B Corporation, Global Leaders Summit in Rome, then a retreat in Assisi. I said, yes. But driving out from the ranch, headed out on that trip, I thought, this will be my last trip. And that was a bit of a bleak thought. <laughs> Wholly unplanned. <laughs> I bumped into a guy, very, very senior UN official, whom I had fought for a number of years. He had been tasked with running a, a UN program that was, that it certainly appeared to be promoting industrial agriculture, and I was not going to let that happen. And so we fought for two years, or I fought and he diplomated. <laughs> and... Uh, and then in the end, the, end, the UN pulled the plug on the whole thing, killed it, and I went, yay, I win. <laughs> and Walter said, at these sessions will be this man that I had fought. And I thought, oh, this will be fun. I'd have always enjoy to uh, meet the guy that I fought. And got there, he gets up, gives a speech on regenerative agriculture I could have given. <laughs> that was what I thought. Wow. I marched up to him, I said, howdy, my name's Hunter Lovins. He laughed, he said, I know who you are. <laughs> yeah, you probably do, huh? After two years of my insurgency. I said, I may have been wrong about you. And he and I sat down and talked. And he pitched me on this idea of, of building this global community. I thought, whoa, that's big. If that could be done, that's, that's the solution. That is enough. <sighs> And I have no earthly idea how to do it, nor do I know anybody who could. You think of all the <laughs> usual suspects. They'd make it all about them. Mm -hmm. And that, that never will work. So I shrugged, didn't think much more of it. We wound up on our way to Assisi on a bus <laughs> crossing uh, the uh, Italian mountains and spent about seven hours together. Somewhere in the middle of Italy, I thought, he can do it. He is the, the kind of humility. It's not about him. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the obvious thought was, what do I do if he asks me to join? Yeah. And a little while later, he said, will you join me? Hmm. And I looked at him. I thought, let's see. <laughs> I work six jobs. I'm uh, supposed to be retiring and I looked at him and said, I will ride for your brand. I said, you've no idea what I just said, but you'll figure it out. <laughs> and since then, uh, we have been just getting after it. And so uh, on my way to Dubai, I will stop off in Germany and spend some time working with the team that he has collected in Germany to, uh, to put a business frame on this as well. And I was scratching my head. How are we going to fund this thing? Doing this is going to cost a lot. How are we going to fund this thing? And he's got a colleague in Germany who said, I have a business model for this. It's like, well, all right then. So we're going to sit down and, uh, and see if we can put that together. Meantime, uh, like everybody else, I'm fundraising, mm -hmm. looking for the money to pull this off in, in the way that he envisioned it. And it's been a little hard. I mean, he's, he's a very senior UN official. If the UN knew what he was up to, they'd fire him. He has family. That, that would be bad. He also has a very important job, and that would be bad for him to lose that. So it's kind of hard going to funders and saying, well, I can't really tell you what I'm doing, and um, I can't tell you who I'm doing it with. Trust me. <laughs> and amazingly enough, some people have done, and that's what's gotten us as far as we've gotten. Mm -hmm.
So, uh, and now we're in conversations with, with some very big funders. So hold that thought. Brilliant. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Hunter. You are so welcome. Great to Pleasure be with to you. Pleasure to be able to do this again. Yeah, absolutely. Bye, everybody. The Why on Earth Community Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series is hosted by Aaron William Perry, author, thought leader, and executive consultant. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. To sign up as a daily, weekly, or monthly supporter, please visit whyonearth.org backslash support. Support packages start at just $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. You can get discounts on their products and services using the code WHYONEARTH, all one word with a Y. These sponsors are listed on the whyonearth.org backslash support page. If you found this particular podcast episode especially insightful, informative, or inspiring, please pass it on and share it with a friend whom you think will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support. And thank you for being a part of the Why on Earth community.